aperture. Hello, thank you all for joining us tonight. My name is Nicola Chumpong. I'm the assistant editor of Aperture Magazine. For those of you who are not familiar with Aperture, it was founded in 1952 by a group of artists, writers, and curators as a common ground for photography. Aperture Today is a multi-platform publisher that unites the photography community in print, in person, and online. Tonight's program is the final event in our month-long series celebrating the New York issue of Aperture Magazine. Aperture has put out a number of city-based issues that typically explore the photo cultures of places quite far from our Chelsea offices, including Sao Paulo, Tokyo, and Los Angeles. However, sometime last year, when we were in the thick of the pandemic's first wave, working remotely, and just wrapping our heads around a radically changed New York, we decided it was time to turn our attention closer to home. The New York issue of Aperture, released on the one-year anniversary of the city's COVID shutdown, honors the city through photographs and essays by visionary artists and writers, reminding us of how much there is to discover and relish when New York comes roaring back. Within this issue, we were lucky to publish two exciting portfolios by the artists with Lean Cadet and Rafael Rios, and we're thrilled that both will be joining us tonight. Both with Lean and Rafael are experts at crafting disarmingly intimate portraits of their subjects, who are more often than not close friends and family members. In her series, Soft, Cadet makes dreamlike black and white photo photographs of friends embracing in New York City parks, while Rios' family series captures vibrant flashes of his extended Puerto Rican family's everyday life in Brooklyn. Both artists, commissioned by Aperture to make brand new work for this issue, have expanded their long-term projects to offer new ways of seeing the tenderness and tenacity of community, a vital offering at a moment of social distancing. For tonight's event, we are going to be offered the special treat of presentations from both Widleen and Raphael. Widleen will go first, then she and I will chat for a bit, then Raphael will have the stage and discuss his long-term family project, and afterwards we'll chat together about the connecting threads between their works. There will be an audience Q&A at the end, so please send any questions you have to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Before I bring on Widleen, I want to highlight that our month-long celebration of this issue has been in collaboration with the Rockefeller Center. The Rock has hosted a public photography exhibition, a pop-up store and gallery, and as you may be able to tell from this very elegant background behind me, they are hosting our virtual talk series. This is not in fact my living room. <laughs> I'm excited to let you know that I am currently calling in from the beautiful Rainbow Room. I'd also like to note that significant support of Aperture Magazine is provided by the Kanakia Foundation and John Stryker and Slobodan Ranjilovic. Aperture gratefully acknowledges Judy and Leonard Lauder for their lead support of the New York issue and Lamont Editions for support of additional editorial content. Further generous support is provided in part by the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. Aperture Foundation's programs are made possible in part by the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of Governor Andrew M. Cuomo and the New York State Legislature. You can also purchase your copy of New York and subscribe to Aperture at a discounted rate by following the links in the chat. I recommend you take advantage of that. Now, with all that being said, I'm thrilled to introduce Widleen, our first presenter. Widleen Cadet is an artist whose practice draws from personal history and examines race, memory, erasure, migration, and Haitian cultural identity in the United States. She uses photography, video, and installation to construct a visual language that explores notions of visibility and hypervisibility, Black feminine interiority, and selfhood. Cadet is a recipient of a number of fellowships, residencies, and awards, including a 2020 Lit List Award, 2020 Museum of Contemporary Photography Snyder Prize, and 2020 NYFA slash JGS Fellowship for Photography. Her work has appeared in The New Yorker, Time, and Wallpaper, among other publications. She earned her BA in Studio Art from the City College of New York, and her MFA from Syracuse University, New York. She is currently based in New York as a 2020 to 2021 artist in residence at the Studio Museum in Harlem. Widleen, can you please join us and turn your camera on? Thanks for having me, Nicole. Um, yes, I'll give you. Yeah, <laughs> I'll start sharing my screen. Um, so I started making this work in 2017. Um, which was a particular time in my life. It was 
the year that I applied to grad school. Um, and it was a year where I think I was probably like feeling kind of lost. I had been out of um, school for like three years or so, and I was out of the comfort zone that the school was providing me. And when I was studying photography, and so in a lot of ways, I think this project came from um, me wanting to find community, community that I was used to having and I was used to taking for granted when I was in school um, and like my peers and my friends. And so I started this project and where I would ask um, my friends or mostly my friends, but also friends of friends, if they would let me photograph with them and if they would bring someone they would like to be photographed with to like parks and all of these pictures were taken around the city and different parks uh, at different times as well. And so in thinking about the whole of my practice, which is very much centered around the idea of having an archive, um, making an archive, having an archive and making sure that um, there's evidence of like lives lived and like relationships that have like formed in terms of like making pictures of my family, taking pictures of my friends. And so I wanted to start this archive of people being photographed with their loved ones. And so I would ask friends if they would like to be photographed, if they could bring someone they wouldn't be photographed with, um, which is like this very simple request. But I think it's this thing that like, you're became, yeah. And I think it's this thing that's become this very much focus of my practice where like, how do I photograph love? How do I photograph community and all of these things that I, as an immigrant, as a person who migrated from Haiti to New York have like been thinking about so much of being that most of my um, family still lives in Haiti and a lot of the love and support that I felt throughout my life has been from close friends um, yeah, and people that I, that aren't necessarily related to me by blood. And so how do I photograph that? Like, how do I make photographs of those people with the people they love as well? And so it became like this exchange. And so I started making these photographs in 2017. In the dead of winter, I was using a four by five, um, which was like this very slow process of first um, finding people who would let me photograph them in January outdoors when it was pretty cold, but also slow in terms of like me setting up the, um, the process of making the photograph itself outside as well with the 4 by 5 And so, um, yeah, I took a break from the making this these pictures because I wasn't living in New York, but then I started doing it again, um, making new work for this uh, edition of Aperture Magazine. And again, this time I expanded from asking um, friends, close friends, but also um, putting out like a call to on my social media asking if people would let me photograph them with their loved ones. And I think one of the things that I was fascinated by was who people would bring to be photographed with. Um, and oftentimes it was just close friends. And I think the other thing that was interesting was to be doing this work um, this past fall, as we were still experiencing this pandemic, but also a lot of the times making these portraits that were very intimate. And like, yeah, during this pandemic, but also people seeing each other for the first time in a lot of ways in person. And so having access to like people like meeting in this way and photographing them in this way, like after such a long time. Um, yeah, I think which felt very different when, consider, like from when I first started the project, which the pandemic was never a thing then in 2017 to now to be making the same kind of photographs, was, which was like kind of a miracle in some ways. So, yeah. And so some people would bring their friends, others would bring their mother. Like, so this, this, for this one, um, I asked a friend of mine from high school who she would like to be photographed with and she brought her mother, which I think was 
yeah, echoes like the importance of creating an archive because a lot of the times in my work, I think about how important it is for um, the generation before me to have images of themselves, but I think more so to have images of them with um, the people they love too. And what does it mean to have like this document um, exist out in the world, not just necessarily in their homes, but also out in the world and like this greater archive as well. Yeah, that's it. Thank you so much, Widlene. Um, I feel really lucky that we've been able to be in conversation a few different times over the past few months. And I also feel lucky that every time I learn a little bit more about your practice. Uh, so something you just mentioned, which I hadn't realized was that this was like an open call to get your subjects. So um, I'm really curious about, given that you didn't really go into it, it wasn't like you made your, your top choices of like this person I need to photograph. It kind of must have been a spontaneous connection. So how did you kind of develop an intimacy in such a short amount of time? It's weird <laughs> um, where like I, I think I photograph strangers a lot. And somehow most of the time, it's usually Black women who answer my calls when I like asked for people to be photographed a lot of the time. And so I don't know why, well, actually I do think, I don't know why, there's probably a lot of reasons why, but there's always like an instant connection. And I think there is like this need um, or this wanting of black women to be seen by other black women. I know for myself, like I, when I get a compliment from another black woman, you can't tell me anything. <laughs> <laughs> When I'm seen by other black women, you cannot, like my ego is just like out of the world. <laughs> so I think that is part of it. I think we like to be seen by each other. We like to be acknowledged because we understand like the ways that we operate in the world. And so I think I'm very fortunate where like, uh, when I am like, when I've like asked strangers to let me photograph them, when I've like put out open calls, it will usually is like an instant connection. And sometimes, most of the time, there's like a follow through connection where I'll photograph that person again and again for different projects as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Something else is like, I feel like um, in your portraits, there's such a precise body language and like, it's like a very specific vocabulary and it's, it's very subtle, but recognizable. So um, I'm fascinated by the fact that you started this in 2017. You mentioned that you took a break and then we were like, can you continue this? How did you kind of, ensure that that body language was consistent? Was it about conversations with your subjects or just shooting practices? I think both, but more so shooting practices, if I had to say. Um, even though I took a break, and honestly, when I was making the work like in 2017, I wasn't as aware of like what I was doing um, as much as I am now, I think um, I was doing like I was asking people to pose, but I was more so asking um, just like, yeah, I think I was just asking in terms of like, as a matter of asking less so aware of what I was asking them to do. But I think now after living with the images for so long, I can ask for what I want and I know what I want off the top of my head. And so but I was also making other work that I think still reverberate like this like, um, body language and other pictures that I've made over time. And so it's become this sort of like, um, yeah, a second language to me, I think, too. Mm -hmm. And so it's always nice when I encounter people who can understand that second language of like, how do you show love and affection to the person you're being photographed with? And I think because of who they bring with them, that's usually easier because they know this person, they love this person. And so it's like, if I ask them to be like, be affectionate, like hold each other's hands and all of these things, it's something that's like very intimate to them. Like they know these things too. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and just sort of my own personal curiosity when you're shooting, is it, is it silent? Is it kind of just like this ongoing conversation as you get to know each other? Do you play music? It depends on the person, actually. Yeah, it depends. Um, yeah, uh, some people will bring like speakers and everything. And so we'll like play music as we're doing this. 
and others I think it's just like a conversation is happening as I'm trying to take the pictures <laughs> so like we'll be talking and asking like I'll be asking questions yeah it varies person to person okay okay um and you also you just mentioned you referenced the other work you were doing at the time and um for everyone who doesn't know when I mentioned I've been in conversation with with lean recently um it's because we commissioned you to make uh, work for this series we did online with uh, Fuji Film. So you were a rock star doing both commissions at once. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, and I know in our discussions about the series you made for uh, that collaboration, you talked about like wanting this optimism and this serious hopefulness to be a part of it. Um, and I'm getting definitely hints of that as you're talking about people kind of coming together for the first time after the pandemic. But I did want to ask directly, was that optimism a part of this project or was there like another emotional register coming into play? For sure, yeah, I think for sure. Um, like, yeah, I think I really wanted for the optimism to be there. And also just like the idea of like human touch and contact and hugging someone in COVID times is just such a strange thing to me <laughs> at mm -hmm. times. So I think I, yeah, I was excited by that to be making the work then too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. On the flip side, uh, well, I have to reference uh, the beautiful essay that accompanies your work and our issue by the one and only Edwige Danticat. Uh, I was ecstatic that, you know, she was really inspired by your work and wanted to write for it. Edwige is someone who, um, well, she was, I believe, the first Black woman writer that I was assigned to read in school. So um, I just thought it was really lovely to have such an established person, you know, working um working with me. <laughs> um, and so I wanted to ask a bit about some of the things she brings up because she kind of highlights a certain melancholy in the portraits and um she kind of uses this refrain that she quotes from Roland Barthes of absent persists absence persists I must endure it um I'm wondering if you can speak a bit of that uh, melancholy and also about if you feel like uh if there's anything that's absent from the portraits that you maybe intentionally turned your camera away from or yeah if that played a role in your picture making process mm, i think maybe i do think um the idea of absence is something that drives a lot of my work and this one is no exception and so i do think there is a part of it um i started making work because i was missing community i was missing friends i was missing um, family members and so i wanted to capture that with the people that i've met here in some ways as well but also for strangers as well i think there is like the idea of absence drives the work in some ways sorry i actually forgot the second part of your question i'm so sorry uh, <laughs> No, I was wondering about the melancholy and, and what you're answering right now, which is just, uh, oh, I, I also asked about like, is there a way, is there anything that you're intentionally leaving out of the camera frame? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, yes. Um, I think the location, um, thinking about taking people out of context. Usually when I make portraits, uh, a lot of them, well, when I was making portraits in 2017, especially I was making portraits in people's homes, like my family members' homes. And so I think I took a shift where I came out of that. I think, yeah, to more or less think about the idea of family or community, it doesn't necessarily have to be within your home. It can be anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I think I think about that, especially as a person who migrated here. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I would love to pick up on that towards the end of this event, but I know we need to get to the next presentation. So thank you so much, Wibleen. We'll see you soon. Um, and I'll now introduce Rafael Rios, our second artist in conversation. Um, Rafael Rios is a New York-based photographer and artist, an only child and second generation immigrant from Puerto Rico. He began shooting on a Minolta 35 millimeter camera purchased from a local pawn shop at the age of 14. His talent was fostered while attending boarding school in Poughkeepsie, New York. Rios spent his weekends as a teenager traveling home by Metro North train to stay connected with his Fort Greene, Brooklyn neighborhood and to document his family on film. He earned a BA in visual arts from Hunter College, New York, and afterward worked as an assistant for some of the industry's top photographers while honing his craft. Across his work, whether personal or commissioned, Rios is known for his sensitive attention to character and environment that manifests in modern imagery with a candid elegance. His clients include the New York Times, Supreme, Nike, Timberland, 
GQ, Stussy, and ID. Thank you, Raphael. I'll let you get Thank started. You. Hi, how are you? Good. <laughs> uh, I didn't think you guys were going to read that out loud. Um, First off, I'd like to thank everyone at Aperture for including me in the New York issue. It means a lot to me as a photographer and as a native New Yorker. I'd also like to thank Nicole Woodley for chatting with me tonight and everyone watching. Uh, I'm not really a big uh, speaker, so I, I wrote something down that I'm going to read as I share my slideshow. All right, let's start now. Um, my work that's featured in Aperture is from my uh, 2018 monograph, Family, that was published by Bakke Creative Press, along with images from the same series that were not published in the book and new work from this past year that was commissioned by Aperture for this issue. In my slideshow tonight, I've also included some extra images that were not in the magazine, but that are in the monograph. Uh, the images and family were made between 1999 and 2007, starting with the slide of my aunt in the backyard of our house. I made this image on a weekend visit home from boarding school. This was the image that made me realize I wanted to be a photographer. At the time, I was really obsessed with photography, especially documentary photography and diaristic style photography. I was looking at the works of Lartigue, Freelander, Tina Barney, Larry Sultan, Sally Mann, and David Armstrong. I loved how they all chose to share their lives and the people they care for in images. It's what really inspired me to do the same in my work. But one thing that list didn't have is representation of Latino life and culture. So after boarding school, I moved back home for, I moved back home for, for college. In college, I majored in photography. Everything I learned about making pictures, I'd practice at home with different members of my family, whether it be learning how to use strobes on location or even trying to figure out the eight by 10 field camera. There was always someone in the house who would sit for me. Over the years, I feel like everyone just got used to me and my camera. I was constantly shooting, family gatherings, Thanksgiving, Christmases, barbecues, hanging out in bed, funerals, literally everything. Um, Besides making this work, I honestly felt like it was a way for me to reconnect with my family after going away to boarding school. And it gave me purpose within the world of our family. Even when school was over, I still continued documenting, documenting my family, even though I no longer lived at home. When I go visit, I always made it a point to always have my camera with me. Uh, then in 2016, I felt like it was time to put these images into the world in book form. That was a bit of a process because I never really had a proper archival system. Everything was in binders, but not really in any order. So for about six months, I just sat there and digitized everything. For any young photographers that may be listening, if I can give you one piece of advice, make sure you properly archive everything. You don't ever wanna look through 20 boxes looking for that one picture you took at that one party. Uh, there's no way I could have put this series together without some kind of order. Um, I also really enjoyed the process as well. Looking back at everything with fresh eyes, I saw a lot of good images that I didn't see the first time around. Now that I got it all organized, I just needed to figure out what I wanted to say. It kind of felt like a puzzle. The first step was getting rid of images that may have been great visually, but didn't necessarily make someone look good. Having everyone look good in each image was always important for me. Because at the end of the day, this is my family and I definitely don't want them upset with me. I also know as a photographer, I have a responsibility for the, for the way their images are perceived in my books or in shows. The next step of the process was linking these images together. I thought about when do families get together it's usually when something bad happens or a celebration of sorts. So I, or I organize the images in that manner. And family, the first, the first third of the book is portraits of everyone. I look at it as the introduction where you get to meet everyone, usually in their own space. The next section of the book focuses on my aunt, who's the matriarch of the household. She's in this photograph. 
uh, for me, why this section is so important is you see everyone showing up. Uh, showing up is one of those things that at the end of the day, that's all that matters. When it comes to family or friends, you can't always change the circumstances of a situation, but you can always try your best to be there physically. Something that has been really challenging this year for sure. I looked at the book this morning, thinking about this presentation, and that's what stood out to me. The family book is made up of the people that have always showed up for me. Something else that I thought I needed to capture was a sense of humor and intimacy, which I try to do every time I press the shutter. It's also great to share my own gaze as a Latin man, sharing our joy, our pain, and our stories. You can especially see that in the last section of the book where, where it's all about the celebrations, the birthday parties, the trips to Coney Island, summer barbecues, even the 2003 blackout, this photo right here. Uh, thinking about hanging out, it's something that we all wanna do. Uh, then I fast forward to everyone's favorite year, 2020. The world has basically stopped my wife and I are expecting our first child. We find ourselves being restricted from having any physical, any physical connection with friends or family. We are walking over a cold, empty Brooklyn Bridge once a month for doctor's appointments and sitting on the couch, listening to helicopters, listening to helicopters in the sky every night. All we pretty much have is each other and a baby on the way. And then in June, we are blessed with a beautiful baby girl, Renee. Our lockdown has consistent has consisted of keeping Renee healthy and happy. As photographer, I'm no longer the young adult I was when I was photographing family. I'm now a husband and the father photographing my own family. There's a scene in Renee. We're just hanging out in the park, listening to that little speaker. There was just a lot of, uh, a lot of park time this past year with us. Hey, there she goes. All right. All right, in this image of my mother and her mask, you see her sanitizing her hands, preparing to hold her four month old granddaughter for the first time. And the next image, you have my cousin Mimi, who just got home from work. Still in her bus driver uniform, blowing Renee a kiss, for, blowing Renee a kiss from a distance. This is the only kiss Renee's received from someone who's not me or my wife. This version of family is very different than what's in my book. And I look forward to when my daughter can experience that version of family. Uh, and we're back to one. All right, I think I'm done with my presentation. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I, I, I'm not a big fan of uh, presentations. So I, I wrote something. And yet it was so good. <laughs> you gave us the whole scope of this book's history, even included some advice for young photographers. So thank you for that. Yeah, I, that, I wish I knew that. I was, I, honestly, I've also done it for other people, so I don't know why I didn't do it. <laughs> Oh, um, so yeah, like as I'm hearing you talk, it's very clear that this has been, I mean, it's really, this project is becoming your life's work. You've been working on it since you were a teenager. Uh, so I'd love to first just hear about like stylistically, how has it shifted over the years? Like, do you feel that your relationship to the series has changed as you've grown as a photographer and just as a human? Um, no, I feel like, after putting out in the world, it was a great feeling. It was, what felt really good was I was always concerned about how everyone in my family would would see it, and that I think that's what took so long. I I I think that edit was just needed to be right on. Everyone needed to be presented in a certain way, and uh, they all love it. So I they love it. I love it, mm -hmm. and also it's. I feel like when I was making the work and trying to get work, like working from whether it be a commercial or whatever aspect, I, in the beginning, it was, it was tough. People were like, oh, that's cool, but, and would never like hire me to do anything. And now like the book is out, it's in the world. 
I feel like times have changed a bit and I get work from it and I get hired to make my image. It's like people see this book and they're like, all right, we want this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I, I feel like as a working photographer it's like that's what you want you want to get hired to make your image yeah yeah the work that you love not someone's yeah mm -hmm. I mean occasionally you do the other stuff but whatever <laughs> <laughs> um well I guess relating to the other stuff um since you kind of you started your photographic career with these intimate personal images as your base I'm wondering like has that influenced how you approach your commissioned work how you're photographing public figures and strangers do you feel like it bleeds over at all yeah now at this point I think I've gotten comfortable where it's you get hired they're hiring you to make your picture you make your picture and I feel very comfortable doing that and I yeah I I, I enjoy it I I feel like I'm missing a part of the question, but. Uh, oh, no, yeah, like it sounds like what I'm hearing is also maybe working on the personal work first established a certain confidence in your your style. So even when you're being hired, perhaps it's um, you kind of, you know, the look you're going for because you've kind of established it in the personal realm. Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah no, totally. I, it's it's like you're coming there to do what you do and it, mm -hmm. that's, what you, that's what you want, yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, you also, uh, you've talked a lot about how obviously there's like an editing and filtering process to make sure your family is on board with the images. Um, at the same time, when I look through the images, they feel so like unguarded and raw and, you know, just unfiltered. Um, and so I'm wondering what your technical tactics are to do that. Like, are you consciously taking pictures really quickly or using a smaller camera as a way of them not being as aware or do they just at this point they don't even care if the camera is in their face uh i, I feel like it's a combination because i've I, I did it for so long they 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 don't care and then in the beginning also was it's like film photography and it was like in the dark room i was i would i never got prints made i barely made contact sheets i would just print one here or there so they never saw the photographs so they never after a while, they just didn't care. And also, I just shot a lot and I'm not fast. So it's they just stopped paying attention. Mm -hmm. That's kind of but, a place to get to, I feel. Yeah. And then also, I feel like part of the process, it's just being just being present. And yes, you're going to get the image. You want to try to get something, but it's you make it happen. It, you, there's no need to rush. Mm -hmm. I, I can wait. So. Yeah, and, th and then you just shoot a lot. There's like 30 binders of this picture, of these pictures, and there's 90 pictures. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But. And I know when we were making the selection for the portfolio in the magazine, it was the hardest thing was just like cutting down <laughs> because oh. there are so many and there are so yeah. many. Um, and I'd love to talk a bit about, you know, the portfolio and the issue and us commissioning you to make new work. Um, Cause I think that the images that you've made over the years, something that stands out so much is just like how many, they're just like brimming with your family members and kind of that clustering of family feels so like central to it. So I'm curious what it was like working under new like isolated conditions with social distancing and things and how that chain might have changed your relationship to the series. Um, I don't think it, it changed it. I, I, I guess make we were just taking pictures in the house or just in the park. Um, I don't know with COVID and everything, and having like just having a new a newborn baby. My wife and I like as our first kid. We I, neither one of us have changed a diaper before Renee, and we were just trying to just be as responsible as possible, and be, yeah, be as responsible as possible. And uh, the work later, like with my family. That wasn't till like months down the line. I feel like every day you would check the news and like guidelines have changed. You can do this, you can do that, you can do that. And they're like, oh wait, 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 you can't do that again. Sorry. But I don't know. I just I just continue to just keep shooting. I whether it be my camera, my phone, it was just there was always some way, I think with technology, you can always find a way to shoot and just I I think I answered your question. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, 
No, uh, I think also something special about the new work that you made is, um, and I think like me and my colleagues, Michael and Brandon kind of discussed this, that it feels like you're still finding these clever ways of having the larger family presence. Like there's this one image um, called mom sanitizing her hands. Oh, yes. Where, you know, it's your mom with the mask, like with the hand sanitizer, very much like a 2020 portrait. But then in the background, you see this older portrait of her. So I don't I know. I love a picture in picture. A picture in a picture. It seems like a pattern across. So yeah, were there any other ways you were sort of trying to subtly kind of create a doubling effect or, or just kind of have these cross references across time in the images? Um. I, when I was putting the presentation together, I was just looking at like the last picture of my cousin blowing the kiss, and it's just like the stoop. It's it's. I feel like that's our our family foundation is like that building, that house, mm -hmm. and it. I feel like just like looking at the steps. That that alone was just like kind of like connecting the work for me, mm -hmm. and also at the same time, I. I I, I see this as the beginning. And the way, like, I feel like my process is to shoot, 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 look later. Mm -hmm. So that was the one thing with the, with the, the commission work with Aperture. I was like, I was like, Ooh, I just, it's like, it was like somewhat shooting like editorial is like you, you shoot these pictures and they're out. Like mm -hmm. I, I, I've waited so I was for, for personal stuff. It just feels a little different. I, I feel like you want to let it marinate and you want to look at it and you want to look at all of it together and then put it together. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, mm -hmm. but I, I I really like new photos too, so they're cool. I love the new photos. So, <laughs> you know, I'll let you marinate, but I, I hope uh, that you'll, you'll continue to pour them out into the world soon. <laughs> yeah, and I feel like, yeah, and now like more you have like social media as you're you're more you're more prone because more people are gonna see it. You just put it out, but yeah. I don't know my process. I, I always wait a couple weeks. Look and then look look and then look again why not mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i think that's a wise mantra <laughs> um well i think we can bring with lean back in to make this a group chat <laughs> so with lean if you want to turn your camera on hi hey what's up <laughs> hi <laughs> So I have a few questions for both of you, but also if you guys have questions for each other, please feel free to <laughs> join in in that. Um, so I want to first like talk about how you guys felt about your work being contextualized within the New York issue, because I feel like in both of your bodies of work, in some ways they're very geographically specific with lean like you you know your focus is these new york city parks and Raphael. i feel like you know the both the apartment interiors and the neighborhood snapshots are just very recognizably brooklyn um at the same time i feel like you guys are both kind of like zeroing in on these interpersonal intimacies that kind of take precedence over like the location and you know so i'm curious about how the new york geog like geographical landscape kind of factors into how you think of your work is that an important distinction for you i think it is um yeah i think it is um just because new york um is like such a near and dear place to my heart um new york city specifically um i grew up here um, when I first moved from Haiti. So it's been like this, yeah, it's been so important in my formative year. And so I think the idea of the geographical location being important is there. But I think that's something that I'm still figuring out in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, my relationship to like going to parks and things like that. And that's just the kind of like hanging out area. Yeah. But I do think it, I, I was really happy that it like the work was featured in the New York um, issue specifically just because it has such a New York has such a special place in my heart in a lot of ways. What about you, Raphael? Oh, it definitely plays a big role. It's it's where I grew up. Uh, uh, especially like the past year, I feel like just when I go out, it's I've been on, I just literally, for the most part, I've been on foot. I'll, I'll have a baby strapped to me and I'll walk and you can only go so far like that. But it's like, and also it's the park. The park is a, a big deal. Uh, it's, it's, it's nature for, for my daughter. It's, 
the park I went to as a kid. It's mm -hmm. near my mom's house. And I, my wife's from, from New York. I'm from New York. Uh, this is what we know. I, I went to Poughkeepsie. That's the one thing I, I wish I went. I wish I had the New York City public school experience. I wish I had the bus pass. I wish I knew about going out at lunch. I, I, I went to, I went off Route 9 and ate at a restaurant called Cappuccino's. But that was my high school experience. But that was, that was why I came home every weekend. I wanted to be here. I, yeah, New York definitely is the background for sure. And also, I think as far as photography goes, it's, I feel like, yeah, this is where you, this is, this is where it happens. I, 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 I believe, I think. Mm -hmm. You just brought up an interesting point about, you know, traveling the city with your daughter. And um, well, one, I'm curious about how both of you, like, do you travel the city by foot? Do you feel like that's like a place of inspiration for you? And um, has the way that you just navigate New York shifted uh, due to the pandemic in any way? Uh, oh, we don't, yeah, we don't, we haven't really done any public transportation. So it's, we just hit, hit Hit, hit the streets, which is fine. We are, we stay in our zone, what we do, but also, yeah, I, I, I walk down the street and I see stuff. I, I enjoy like seeing funny stuff. Mm -hmm. That as far as me is just, just looking mm -hmm. and also just also looking to stay away from people, but <laughs> I have a baby on board, watch out. Yeah. But yeah, um, I, I used to see, I, I, I do a lot of running, so I would see a lot of it running, but now it's just, you see it at a slower pace and I've learned to appreciate it. I, my wife loves to walk. I used to never want to walk and now I'm like going for two walks a day. <laughs> it's just like, you get to look. Yeah. And what about you, Whitley? And I remember when we were talking in the fall, it, it seemed like you were doing a lot of walking to make your portraits. And it was kind of like, as you would pass things by that would serve as inspiration perhaps. Mm -hmm. And I think when you like this question actually gave me an answer to your previous question as to why parks, I think um, I do most of my working I do in parks. Um, yeah, I don't think I've changed so much in terms of like how I get around the city. I still take trains, which is getting more crowded by the day again. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I take trains, but I think a lot of it is that I, I'll take trains to parks to walk within the park <laughs> limits, basically, yeah. Okay. Um, another question I had was, um, with Lean, I read in some of your past interviews that you have this habit of taking pictures for the subject um, for their own purposes first, and then taking things that are kind of serving your own artistic needs. Uh, is that still something that you do? And um, you know, are there any other tactics that you're following to kind of create this mutual exchange in your picture making? Yeah, um, I'm still doing it actually. And funny enough, um, that is one of the things I offer when I like put out calls for people if they want to be photographed by me. Um, and like one example is that uh, the people who like ask um, if they can be photographed by me, they will ask for like headshots for a purpose, like for work purposes and things like that. So I still do that. Um, what else do I do? Yeah, I think I just like leave it open to whoever wants whatever they need. Most of the time people don't ask um for things but when they do i'm like totally open to whatever um if they see me yeah and Raphael, kind of similarly i feel like i i noticed that you, you have like equal parts candid shots as well as the more posed images um that kind of made me curious like is this the image that was asked for is this the unguarded one that you know taking the posed image cleared way for uh so i'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit about how you navigate you know balancing the image that you see versus the image that someone's kind of requesting or in your family? Oh, I just take both. And then it's film, they don't get to see, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <Get to see. laughs> see you later. They could, I'll deal with that after the fact, but at the same time, for me, I, if, if I'm in the moment, why not do both? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's great to catch that, that moment. It's, there's like the one picture that you guys picked for the edit. It's, 
everyone getting ready for a party to go out and it's just my cousin Armani she's looking dead at the camera and just like I love it when there's like just like a lot going on and you all of a sudden you just catch like the attention of that one person it's that one person watching you and they're just aware and just like amongst the chaos because the chaos images are fun it's just like when stuff's going on it's you watch it you shoot it and, and I'm not I'm not super fast shooting so I was just like when I get it I get super psyched mm -hmm. it's like you catch that moment but yeah, I'll do both. Why not? Yeah. Who wants to go back and do it again? <laughs> <laughs> I feel that. Um, and when you were presenting, Raphael, you spoke a bit about um, some of the photographers who have been really influential to you. And I'd love to hear from both of you about um, artistic influences, whether photographic or otherwise, um, who are kind of the pillars for you or places that you go when you need a little boost of inspiration. Um, maybe with Lane, you could start us there. I first want to say every time someone asks me this question, I immediately forget. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, like, I feel like as soon as like that question starts to come out, like I've, all my memories just like go away. <laughs> but I will say like, I really enjoyed, you know, often um, such a iconic, master so I'll say that and then it, I'm yeah everyone else I'm, I'm forgetting right now <laughs> I'll get back to you <laughs> I appreciate the honesty <laughs> yeah and Raphael are there any people outside of the photo world um that you turn to uh I don't know I, I like to look at paintings mm. names I couldn't really give you but <laughs> I love like the traditional portraits of like Alice Neal and like Kerry James Marshall and uh, I, I don't like old photo albums I like looking at. Mm. It doesn't even have to be like anyone. It's just like, I feel like you pick up a photo album. There's always going to be something good. Mm -hmm. I'll even just go on eBay and look at old Polaroids. That's fun. There's always something there. It's just like, weird off moments that I enjoy. I, I enjoy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm bad at keeping up with photography. Which is not always a bad thing. There's so many pictures, especially now there's so many <laughs> photographers. Yeah, it's sometimes a nice refresh to kind of look other yeah. places. Yeah. Um, I also, oh, sorry, yep. Paul. Go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna say, funny enough, I get like inspired by Disney movies. Uh -oh. um like disney cartoon movies for some reason like whenever i have like a block or something like that i'll go i renew my disney subscription and start watching <laughs> disney movies for some reason it just gets it done well there's that optimism <laughs> <laughs> i honestly think that's it <laughs> yeah, yeah well um i'm gonna be switching to audience q a this is a question that i had but also uh stuart cooper has which is what are you doing next? I'd love to know what both of you guys are planning on doing with these series or maybe other bodies of work that you're initiating now. You can't tell that. It's a secret. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, wait for the surprise, man. <laughs> well, if you answer, are you definitely continuing the family series? Oh yeah, it's like ongoing. It's there's there's more images to look at I have it that I haven't looked at. Mm -hmm. They're archived, but I haven't looked at them. But yeah, but I, I just, just maybe just figuring out the right format for it. But mm -hmm. then other work as well. I, I I also just love just like travel. Well, I guess we can't travel now, but traveling and shooting. Just I really love taking still lifes as well. Mm -hmm. With Lean, are you also keeping it close to your chest or is there anything no. you're going to share? <laughs> I have no secrets. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I do want to continue um, making this body of work, actually. I think it'll be one of those works that I do um, for a long time, not necessarily continuously, just like at different periods. Um, yeah, so I, I think I'm going to continue with this series. Uh, I'm excited to see how it changes and how it takes different shapes. But um, I also, I guess, in terms of what I'm doing next, I'm currently preparing for a show in the summer. 
Um, yeah. Congrats. Thank you. Very exciting. <laughs> Um, Natalie Stanton says, as someone who struggles taking photos indoors, what tips do you suggest to get better light in darker rooms? Do the flash. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I recommend flash as well. I think it takes some time to get used to, but I think the more you practice with it, I was actually very against the flash, but somehow now it's become the main thing I use in all of my pictures. It just changes things. Mm -hmm. Um, and then on the flip side, um, and Hussein asks for with lean when shooting outdoors, what type of lighting do you use? And also how do you get your sitters to pose? Is it organically or do you direct them? It's a mixture of both. Um, I, yeah, sometimes I'll come into uh, like making a picture and I'll have like an idea or I'll see like images somewhere that I, I wanna like like body movements or like body um, positions that I want to recreate for like specifically for my pictures. So sometimes I come in with like a specific idea that I want. And other times I think um, it just happens organically. But funny enough, um, even when I come in with like an idea in my head, sometimes what I have in my head and what the body can actually do are two different things. So like what ends up happening is that people will move however they can organically anyways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of lighting system do I, do I use? Um, I just use flash. Um, like I'll have like two or three remote flashes going off usually. It's just easier for me to take it everywhere. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Amy Silverman has a question for Raphael, which is, uh, how do you bring your personal vision slash work to your commissions? Is it easy to apply the same kind of intimacy with people who you don't already have a relationship with? Because uh, I, I think it depends on each individual, but I think with anything, it's just, basically you just start off with just having a conversation and you talk and if, if you're given the time, you, you can make it work and you guys can communicate. I just think it's about just talking with your subject and getting them comfortable. You find like a mutual connection and you build off that. And mm -hmm. then fingers crossed, you get, you, you get the picture. Mm -hmm. um, so with Lean, you talked a bit about um, working with, oh, well, not working with, but uh, thinking about Dina Lawson as like a big inspiration for you. Um, I think they're really gonna try to pin you down on naming more inspirations because <laughs> Christopher Desange asks um, if there were any specific artists slash photographers that you were thinking about when making soft. Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, I love Dowd Bay's portrait. Um, I think he makes like phenomenal portraits of like like beautifully tonally, just beautifully compositional portraits. And I'm sure there are others. It's just like right now, my memory is just not doing me any justice. <laughs> I'm the same way when someone's like, "So what are you reading?" It's like, "Am I reading ever? I don't know." Do I know how to read? <laughs> I think Twitter is considered reading. <laughs> okay, then I'm an avid reader. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, and I think we have one last time for one last question uh, from Joyce. Um, hi, Joyce. I know this person. Uh, she asks, um, as photographers, to what extent do you feel the need to chronicle the moment we are collectively experiencing? Do you sometimes think of yourself as an artistic historian? I'm struck by the presence of face masks and hand sanitizers in some of your images, for example. Raphael, if you want to. Oh. Uh, I think, yeah, I think any every photographer is documenting it uh, and they're all doing it in their own way. Uh, I, I enjoy a hand sanitizer. My mom has a very extensive mask collection. Mm. Um, but at the same time, I'm really ready for everything to be over. But in the meantime, I'll take pictures of it. Is there another part of that question or no? Um, well, I, I think relating to that is like, do you feel then like a responsibility to do so? Do you feel any room maybe to, you know, take pictures that are completely outside of our current moment? Uh, I think you should do both. I mean, every, 
every picture doesn't have to have a mask and we know that we can do that safely. Um, but at the same time, why not, why not make that recording? I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't feel a connection to like, I gotta get that mask picture, but I, I, I'd rather shoot it and have it and think about it later. Mm. And wiggly. Do I mask? Uh, I think I do. Um, funny enough, I think when I was making like the new photographs for the commission, I decided not to include mask or anything. You know? Which I think goes back to something you mentioned like our last time when we were writing about my work is that I do like to erase time in a lot of my works. And so, yes, I do feel like a need to chronicle um, the current moment that we're living in, but I, I do it in separate ways. And so like I'll have like these disposable cameras on me where I'll like be shooting like what's been happening like within my family within like the world as well but I think sometimes like depending on the work I'm making I don't necessarily feel like I want that in there yeah which is kind of like a deception when like I'll be looking at these images like 20 years in the future and you wouldn't be able to tell if they were taken during the pandemic here and that might honestly be a gift for us all <laughs> 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 this gear to be a memory that's kind of fading out. <laughs> well, I, I, hear feel, that. <laughs> I feel like that's a good place to end. Um, but thank you both so much for shedding this light on your practice and these bodies of work. Uh, we're just so grateful to have the series and the new work that you made for us in the issue of New York, uh, the New York issue of Aperture Magazine. So thanks so much for your contributions. Thank you for having you me. Well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, um, and everybody who's stayed with us, uh, I hope you will take advantage of that link to get a discount on the issue and a discount to the subscription um, to Aperture Magazine. And thanks so much for tuning in. I hope everyone has a great night. Bye. Bye.